Thank you uh, very much for the invitation and for the support. And it's lovely to be here and see many familiar faces. I am enjoying my second visit to Korea very much. Yes. So this is um, work I have been doing with John Sullivan, who some of you might know, and Nancy Rinkle. And um, there's really um, two separate pieces of work in one big story. So I will try and explain. Um, so I, I'm, I will use this as an example of, um, this is a physical knot and you can, you can ruin the cord and do things with it. This is a three-dimensional problem, this thick strand in space. What I want to do is look at a um, two-dimensional problem. How does this work? There we go. So I'll introduce the idea and explain this two-dimensional problem. And then I will do this other piece of work, this maximal ball medial axis work. And I'll finish off by explaining um, in the plane what ribbon length minimizers are. So this is my mother. My mother um, taught handcrafts for many years. So we imagine, you know, ribbons in the plane. Um, she's now very old and doesn't do handcrafts, but this is when she was younger. Um, and this is Sarah Marie Bel Castro. Um, she's knitted knots. You see, they're, they're flat. There's a orange trefoil and a blue trefoil, and they're linked together, but they're flat in the plane. So that's the idea. Instead of a three-dimensional problem, which is hard, we put things in the plane. So I, we need to bring the mathematics into the story. So I want to think about I want to think about this kind of picture where this is the knot diagram and, and this is uh, a ribbon around the diagram. And this is meant to be constant width, but I'm not very good on the computer, so it should be constant width. Oops. Okay, so, so that's the idea. And then the mathematics. So I think about the knot or the link as an immersion and together with the crossing information um, and I'll explain what I mean. Now this is a very regular projection and in yesterday's talk lots of regular knot diagrams in the afternoon but for us we'll see that we don't have to have regular projections we just we're just looking at not projections so what do i mean by um the crossing information so um we have um the abstract circle it's being mapped into the plane so we look at all points pairs of points on the circle which map to the same point like like this point here right there are two points mapping to one point so that's what I want our delta to be so when I'm thinking about this it's a two, it's a it's a immersion into the plane together with this set and then I give um, crossing information so I have an immersion and combinatorial information. So I say, um, you know, x is over y plus 1. And then, um, well then y is under x, so it should be minus. Right, this makes sense. And then this one, if I have three strands, x is over y, y is over z, x has to be over z. Right, so, um, so the beautiful thing is, this is purely combinatorial. The, the important thing is continuous. This is very important. Yeah. So, but 
Yes. As I understand it, R delta is a discrete set, isn't it? So um, not necessarily. You could have. You could okay, have. So it means if you have multiple crossings. So. You could have. Oh, okay, okay. Something okay. like that. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Um, you can use. Um, yes. yes, I understand. Yeah, you can use regular point set topology. You know, you have a compact Hausdorff space. You have a local and you have a local and in, locally injective function, and you can show that um, only a finite number of points map to one point. Yeah, you can okay. do things like that. The equivalence classes are discrete. Things like that. Um, this is important also when you think about ribbon, right? So how do I think about my ribbon? Um, so uh, this is a link. I could ignore that and make it a knot. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to take a point on my um, we're going to take a point on my um, link and then push off in the normal direction. So let me go back. So I'm here, and I push off in the normal direction, and I give that interval. And um, so I have a width. We say that our width W ribbon is allowed if the ribbon is immersed, and the crossing information agrees. So the crossing information, remember, has to be continuous. This is the other idea. So, so there's there's um, there's an overlap here. So the this all of this is over, all of this under here, right? So we don't have um, ribbon doing this. I'm either it, the 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 continuity of the crossing information is a strong assumption. It's a it's necessary assumption. And then uh, we say the width of the diagram is the widest ribbon allowed. We make it the soup. <sighs> yes, unit normal. Oh, unit, yeah, unit normal. Thank you for the correction. Yes. So this is, this is trying to capture this idea. Okay, so here's the picture. So this is um, actually, it's, it's like so much, maybe there's an easier way to say this. So if I, if I think how wide can this ribbon be, there's local curvature. So if I make this ribbon very fast, it will break the immersion. So curvature plays a role. Then if I look here, I have, I have, a, I have um, over, and then this guy is over, this guy is over, there's a weaving. So if I bring the ribbon in, it, it will bang into each other. So there's a global condition here. So this is our theorem. This is our idea that the, this is another way to understand width. And this problem I told you about rope length, its history is similar. They define the rope length with the, um, an embedded tube around the knot, and then what's an equivalent way to understand that. So this is meant to mimic the history of that theory. So here is an observation. Um, just straight off the bat, um, to be immersed, you have to have the width over 2 less than the radius of curvature, right? And, and we're talking about the width over 2 is that the problem with, is always a factor of 2. <laughs> um, and then this means straight away that your curve has, um, you must have some geometry on the curve. So it tells you that the, the immersions are just not random immersions. They're this C11 class. So that means C1 is continuously differentiable. The first derivative is continuous. The 1 means the first derivative is Lipschitz, which means the second derivative is bounded and exists almost everywhere. So an example 
of a C11 curve is to take stadium curve, half a circle, straight line, and half a circle. This is a C11 curve. Okay, the, the second derivative does not exist here. It's fine, it's measure zero. But um, that's the class of curves that we can talk about. So um, this is sort of the plan, find equivalent definitions of width, minimize ribbon length for some in a, in a, in a class, and um, you know, show that minimizers exist, uh, find examples of them, maybe long-term goal, prove a criticality theory. If I, vary, if I vary my diagram, how does the ribbon length change? Okay, so, oops, so to, to talk about one is today. <laughs> And I show some examples later, but this is enough. This is hard. So um, we already know um, that the curvature, I want to talk about the weaving, this weaving idea and how to explain that mathematically. So um, I look at, yes. Actually, in regular diagram, not diagram, yes. only double points allowed and cheaper this is not regular, so we could have triple points. Triple points allowed, yes, and and intervals, non-transverse intersections allowed, yes, yes. And C11, you can imagine um, a straight line and then infinite wiggles. That's allowed, but you can show that the ribbon eventually must always be over or always be under with, with the wiggles. You can prove this, but I, I will not talk about this. Yeah, these are good observations. Um, okay, I want to talk about the weaving. So we talk about, um, we talk about a part of a diagram, like this is, this is a part of a diagram, or I think about this part of the diagram. And I think about these um, arcs as being gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, gamma 4 around the edge. And it goes for A1 to B1. So what you want is as you walk around, I want to, in this direction, I want to always jump down. Right? I always want to have BI bigger than AI. So, um, so this BI is bigger than the AI of this guy. So I'm jumping down, jumping down, jumping down, jumping down, jumping down, jumping down. So this is the alternating. It's capturing the weaving. This one is not alternating because we have a problem here. Okay, so, so um, that's the idea. And then an alternating region is this, this region bounded by this loop. And um, this is embedded, but it turns out that to get the theory to work, you need immersed regions. Ah, tricky, very hard, very hard, surprising. So, okay, so how do I put a limit on um, the, the width with the weaving? So you look at, in this, in this alternating region, you look at the biggest inscribed ball, biggest inscribed disk. Because at the center, this will be equidistant from the edges, right? And that will capture where the ribbon comes in. So we want the width over two to be less than this biggest radius. Okay, and then this is for this region. Now we have to do this for all regions. Here is another alternating all the way around. Do it for everyone. So this will control. Yes. Hey, but you do not assume that they are convex, right? So you might have several circles to check. Um, there'll be one maximum. <coughs> okay. 
So, so let me draw a picture if I understand you. If, if I have a region, I don't know, like this, I just draw a polygonal one, this, yeah. this point, I want to be equidistant from a point and a line, so I'll have like a parabola. Okay, yeah. So, like a, a family of circles, yes. So there'll be many, okay. many circles, many maximally, many, many circles, and you find the biggest one. Is that all right? Okay, let's keep going. So here is our conjecture that half the width, right, half the width is the minimum of the radius and cu of curvature and the infimum of these um, of these maximal balls. That's that's the idea. So we capture the local global. In in rope length, the the thickness is um, the mini minimum of the radius of curvature and a doubly self-critical distance where the strands come close to each other. So it mimics that theory. Um, so, I'll talk about these inequalities. This is still in progress, it's quite tricky. Um, so I'll talk about this. I'll talk about this. So this one, we've already shown, right? If the width is bigger than the radius of cur curvature, the ribbon is not immersed. So we must have this. And this is the interesting one that I will talk about. Okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so I want to explain, um, I want to explain where immersed comes in. For a long time, uh, we thought um, we just needed embedded disks. And this is a long project, and then we realized with this example we needed immersed disks and everything went to pieces. It became much harder. So, you look at this and you ask yourself in this example, what controls the ribbon? How thick can the ribbon be? And you know, here is an alternating one gone, and I have a nice big alternating two gone here. But, but this, will, this, this will be turning out to be too, too big. Um, it turns out that um, there's some kind of weaving happening up here. So it turns out that this, this region, which is immersed, I'll explain, started this corner, started this corner, and I jump down, and I walk all the way, this is the boundary, jump down, and then I come back, and I jump down, and then I come this way. And I go all the way around, and I jump down again and finish. So, so this, this is like a disc where, where these overlap. And this is the region that controls the thickness. So, so um, hmm, interesting, interesting. Proving things for embedded disks is easier than proving things for immersed disks. Okay, so this is... When we got found this example, we stopped doing our research for six months. We were very depressed. But then we picked up and we kept going. So... <laughs> okay. So, um, let's, let's uh, prove this inequality. So, um, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to assume that my width of my ribbon is bigger than the in radius and try and find a contradiction. So, I look at all these balls in this example. This is the biggest one about. And I assume that my ribbon is bigger here. So I have ribbon from this side, ribbon from this side, and they're overlapping right here. Um, and then if you think about it, 
this ribbon is over this ribbon. So as I, and the crossing is continuous. So as I move across to here, this side is over this side. But now, if I come from this direction, this is under. Right, so right here I have a contradiction. So I have to have this less than the in radius. Okay, and then a more complicated shape. Okay, same kind of idea. Imagine this is over this, over this, over this, right, all the way around. I compare um, ribbon from here, ribbon from here, and um, I get this is over this here, this is over this, so at this point, this is over this. And I work my way around the diagram and I get a contradiction again. So it's a little more complicated to write down. You have to follow in the branches and make comparisons and go around. But the idea is the same. The idea is the same. Now, ah, so these lines are representing the center, I didn't say this, are the centers of these maximal balls. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. And so this, this style of proof only works when the centers of the maximal balls is a finite tree. Okay. So, hmm, new theorem to prove. So now we have to understand the centers of the maximal balls in immersed disks, right? That's, that's the plan. So, whew, so this theory, these maximal balls, this me is, is often called the medial axis. Maybe you've heard of this. It's something that computer scientists and engineers study a lot. Um, for example, um, you think about um, animation. You might, a uh, computer scientist might have a stick figure walking in a movie and then grows it to a human. So this idea of this, the centers of these balls is an important, important idea. So, we're going to think of some region in, in R2. We could generalize this theory to Rn. But anyway, let's think, oh, think immersed. Yes, alternating regions. And then um, what I want to do is I want to think about, um, if I'm dealing, I'm not going to talk very much about immersed because there's so much technicality and I have a short talk. But, um, for example, in, um, so, so we're thinking about an abstract disk that maps to the plane and um, it's an immersion and I can pull back the flat metric to, to the abstract disk. And then um, you want to think about a metric completion of this disk, not, an, not a closure. Um, like if I have, oops, if I have a disc but not the slit, right? So it's everything but not this slit. The closure would be this, it's not right. What we want to think about is approaching from both sides. To, to capture the idea. So you think about this metric completion, and then I think about um, balls. Balls here you think of as, as open disks. I use the word ball because that works in any dimension. Um, so you look at the maximal balls, and then there are several sets that you can consider. So for this stadium curve, right, you think about the set of centers of the ball, maximal balls. I start at these ends and I go all the way. Because this, 
right, is a maximal ball, and then I have maximal balls here. Um, if I have an ellipse, okay, it looks very similar, it's not. <laughs> okay, then, then at this end, right, I have, I have a um, osculating ball, right? And then I have another one and I draw this. So for, for this ball, it touches once, right? And then here, it touches twice, okay? So the skeleton, um, it touches at least twice, okay? And the central set, it's just all maximal balls. Okay, so 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 the skeleton here is open, but the central set is a closed interval. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. There's an equivalent way to think about. Um, the medial axis. I'm using the idea of a maximal ball because it's a Merbius invariant idea. Um, but the equivalent story is um, you have some region and you ask yourself um, what's the distance between x this is my point x you ask yourself this is a distance function measures the distance from a point to the boundary and you ask yourself where does this function fail to be differentiable right it's going to to fail to be differentiable if i if i'm here right it fails to be differentiable precisely precisely on the on this set of these maximal balls it's an equivalent way to understand this idea. Uh, sometimes the word cut locus is used, sometimes like there, there are different, um, and then there's a lot of computer science um, papers and all these names are flipped around. People define the central set as a skeleton, pika is used, many different words. So when you read be careful. Okay. Um, sorry. Because here I have I have two. Right, this distance here and here, they're equal. So you think about. It's not even continuous, really. Does that make sense? Yeah. Tricky, tricky. Okay. How are we going for time? Okay, not long. Okay, so what's so big about the medial axis is it's a deformation retract. That's that's a very common theorem. What can we know? If we're a plane a polygon, then um, the medial axis is a finite tree. There it is. Very easy to prove. Um, if you're smooth. Um, then strange things can happen. So this is a curve. It's alpha union beta. This is a part of a circle and then I've added in infinite wiggles. So this medial axis will have the center point and then a ray going down, and a ray going down, a ray going down, a ray going down. There'll be an infinite number of branches and it's smooth. Huh. So this is tricky. This is, and then this is not finite. We want a finite tree. So how about the analytic? It's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, good guess. Analytic works. Analytic works. But, but I'm not, I don't have analytic, right? Okay. I have C11. It's not good. So, another weird thing. So this function, is C2 everywhere, it's twice different, second derivative is continuous, everywhere except at the origin, 
And you can look at, 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 max, at, at maximal balls and you just do the computation, like you ask your undergraduates in your differential geometry class, right? Compute the radius of, conver of curvature, and you can show it con uh, from this way converges to zero or half. So, so in theory, there's balls limiting to the zero or half, but when you compute here, the maximal disk has a radius bigger than one, and it's because it's so it's the x to the 4 term, it makes it very flat. So it's the, the set of maximal balls is not necessarily closed. It's an interesting, interesting, subtle question. Okay, so as, um, there we go, piecewise analytic, well done. So, <laughs> you I'm get, teaching calculus. Yes, yes, <laughs> it's very good. Then the medial axis is a finite tree. And this is usually enough for, for the computer scientists. But for us, I have these C11 curves, and then I have, I have these curves, right, intersecting in corners. So I, I'm not, uh, this is not good. So we need a different theory. So what we've shown is that for our most flat disk if I put a one-sided curvature bound and assume that the in radius is less than the curvature, it's a, it, it l gives you a chance of getting a finite tree. So I have like 10 minutes left, so I will try and give you a flavor. Okay, just a very brief outline. This is like work number two. Ribbons is work number one. This is work number two. Okay, so there's an idea of, um, of when this is something like a parabola, you understand what we mean, or a C2 curve, you understand what we mean by an oscillating ball, right, if it's C2 smooth. But we can have strange things like these stadium curves or, or like this infinite wiggling, how can we capture what's happening? So what we do So I will draw a picture. So let's pick my point P on my boundary. And then I move um, in a normal direction. I move a certain amount of distance. And I ask, what's the least distance to the curve? OK, so, so here this least distance is at P. And then I can move to some kind of osculating ball here. I can keep moving out, and the least distance will be at P. And then when I get, when I get to the center of this osculating ball, everything changes. Because if I go a little bit further out, right, my maximal ball will intersect in two places. So um, x is the center of an oscillating ball and p is no longer locally the closest point. OK, so that's, that's capturing this idea. And this idea works for this and this as well. So these are all oscillating balls. Um, OK, why do we care about oscillating balls? Oh, the other thing is that um, I need to explain the top of the slide. This assume our boundary has a finite total curvature. So what do I mean by that? So I'm looking at a, a region like this, and this is my boundary. So your finite total curvature, if you're rectifiable, and the tangent has bounded variation. So practically, so that's W1BV, that's what that means, rectifiable tangent vectors are of bounded variation. So practically this means um, at every point I have left and right tangent vectors, and then when they don't match I have corners. Okay, it's, it's, uh, I think I meant finally many convex corners, not concave corners. So that's an idea, it's a good class. It, 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 it's, uh, 
It's a familiar class from rope length, um, and it captures what we need for this alternating region. Okay, so you can prove quite easily that um, if I have a point x in the medial axis, and x is a point of infinite branching, or x is an endpoint, then x is the center of an osculating ball. So, so you're in the medial axis, so that means you're the center of a maximal ball. And so if you're a one-fold and a branch point, let me go back up, you're, you're either in this kind of situation, maybe you touch once, you're an osculating ball. Maybe you touch in an interval, then you've got a circle here, you're an osculating ball. If you touch an infinite number of times, right, so um, like this, then the circle is a compact set, so this, this uh, infinite number of um, places where the circle touches has a limit point, and then you just use this definition to see that you're an osculating ball to that limit point. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward, um, pretty straightforward argument. So that means if you're not osculating, you touch at least twice. So this is how many times you touch twice, but finite. It's good. That helps us get a finite tree. So now I assume our conditions. If I have no osculating balls, then um, the medial axis has to end on the boundary. I can't have those, I can't have the medial axis ending at these points. It has to end on the boundary. Okay, so let's get a little bit more geometry to finish up. So this one-sided curvature bound, so um, again back to differential geometry with your undergraduates. So here is my curve. Um, in the plane, um, I set my unit tangent and my unit normal vector to have pos be positively oriented. And then um, I, I give this one plus minus this one this signed curvature. So um, when, when I bend to my left, right, this, this is positive. And when I'm bending to my right, like this should really be here, right? So we say that it's negative. And so what's this one-sided curvature bound I'm going to put on my region? Um, I'm assuming that this one-sided curvature is less than one. I don't bend too much to the left. For, uh, the tangent vector is of bounded variation. Yeah, it's a rectifiable curve. Yeah. Okay, so, hmm, I have no time. So, what do I need to do? So, um, I have to skip to finish. So, um, the idea is that when I have um, an immersed disk with this one-sided curvature and I assume that the in radius is less than one, then um, the idea is that our region contains no osculating balls. So that means the skeleton, I have to skip the details, uh, this means the skeleton's trees has leaves that end in convex corners. So this is not allowed, this is good. Okay, so let me, let me just finish. Sorry, I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip. Skip, skip. There we go. So I, I have finite total curvature and I have k convex corners. Same assumption. Then the set of maximal ball is a compact tree with k leaves. So this is, this is an interesting theorem about the medial axis. And then you can apply this to the ribbon length problem. Okay, that this is exactly what you need. So yeah, so this is the summary. This is this is where we're at. The medial axis result, and I skipped all the details. It's a hard idea. <laughs>
put it together with the ribbon length and then you get this inequality. Okay, and then and then I will just I will just uh, the the minimize it just quickly. Um, this is the half length. So this is what we think that there's ribbon around here, right? There's there's ribbon around here. It's what we think the minimizers look like. So we have some ideas, but I'm out of time. I'm very sorry. Um, so I am going to thank my collaborators, Sarah Marie and my mother. <laughs> and um, I am funded by um, the WNL Research Grant. So thank you, and sorry to skip so much. Thank you very much.